Anyway, 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 good evening, everybody. How are you? Oh. So please go to Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 31. Good evening to all of you. It's very nice. Good evening to, to you as well. Good evening to you as well. Sister it's Jackson. very nice to see all of you. We're going to deal tonight with one of the probably the most controversial parables that Jesus taught, which is uh, the rich man and Lazarus. It really is more a story of heaven and hell. So as we, um, we prepare, I want you to set your mind that you're going to hear some things tonight that may not go along with everything that you think or everything that you believe. I don't know what your beliefs are about hell. I came from a church where hell was not preached that much. So I was really kind of ignorant where hell is concerned. Hold on a minute. There we go. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. That's a lot better. So I came from a church where hell was not uh, something that was talked about often. We knew about heaven. We knew about hell. But heaven was more the reality for the denomination I came from instead of the um, instead of hell. So as we look at this parable of, of the rich man and Lazarus, you're going to see a lot. You're going to see a lot that would have something to do with perhaps the people you go to church with. You're going to see a lot that may have something to do with you. This is a parable that really goes into who you are. It pushes you and it causes you to think. And the handout that, that I created for everybody tonight, when it's time for us to go through to that, then we'll do it. So, But right now, let's go ahead and pray. How is everybody, by the way? Let me ask that. How, how is everybody? Fine. Good. 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 I'm glad to hear that. Now, for your for the parable that we did last week on the Good Samaritan, anybody have an opportunity to be a Good Samaritan last week? Or since we met? Let's put it that way. <laughs> no, nobody had the opportunity. To be a good Samaritan, all right then. Oh, that hurts my heart. I'm gonna have to go to bed saying to the Lord, they didn't get no opportunity to be a good Samaritan. You gotta throw some things their way this coming week. We have to live these things that we're studying. So I always ask the master to throw them my way. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you so much for the opportunity to read your word, to study your word, to dissect your word, and also to eat your word to feast on it tonight, Father, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Always, Jesus, with so much wisdom, you spoke your stories, your parables, showing us the moral ethics and principles of how we should live in a kingdom that is in heaven, but to bring it to earth. We thank you, Master. Now, great rabbi, with all your knowledge, all your wisdom, all your gifts, mm -hmm your gift of the spirit of discernment, your gift of the word of knowledge, your gift of wisdom, Master, come now. Speak to me, speak through me, that I may be edified, your people may be edified, and you may be glorified. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Did anybody get, so you didn't have this, so nobody got the opportunity to read this ahead of schedule, right? Mm. Okay. Does anybody know this story? No? Okay. So we're going to go ahead and get it on the screen and we'll get it um, read. I was just going to well, say, coincidentally, I read it last week. You did? Well, coincidentally, talk to me. Uh, talk, talk to you? <laughs> coincidentally, talk to me. Yes. <laughs> can, can you coincidentally talk to me and tell me what you know? Um. So I just so had, because I've been reading through Luke like over really on and off over the past year. But mm -hmm. I read this exactly a week ago, apparently. I was going back through my journal. But um, so Jesus was, obviously this is a parable. Um, I forgot who Jesus is talking to. I would assume either like a group of people or his disciples, mm -hmm. but we, we don't mm -hmm. see. A group of people. Um, but the story is about literally a rich man and Lazarus. And Lazarus, or yeah, Lazarus was like a very poor, um, 
like low level person in society. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And he was like a beggar and he would often like sit outside of, I would assume like the rich man's estate or wherever he was living. Um, Somewhere close. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the rich man, uh, it doesn't really necessarily say like how they got there or anything, but it just talks about their eternity. So the rich man Mm -hmm. died and Lazarus died. The rich man went to hell and Lazarus went to heaven. Um, And it talks about that Lazarus or the rich man realized that he was in hell because he was in torment. Um, Mm -hmm. And as it says, as he looked up, he saw Lazarus with um, who was it? Uh, It was one of the prophets. Abraham. He was with Abraham. Abraham. Yeah, he was with Abraham, was, not the prophet. It was Abraham. He was with. Okay, my bad. He That's was with crazy. Abraham, and he cries out. It's like, um, Abraham, can you tell Lazarus to dip his finger in some water and, like, just touch my tongue with it because my tongue is on fire. Mm-hmm. I'm burning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and Abraham says to him, basically, I'm paraphrasing. Like this was. This was your eternity. No, that's like all of that's all of your all of your gifts that were given to you were those on earth, and this is mm-hmm. what this is where your destiny was. But Lazarus took the humble state of a servant his whole life. A beggar was very lowly, and he ended up going to heaven. Um, so it was very humbling, and it really uh, really makes you think about like how you're living your life now. Um, what are you looking forward to in the future? How are you living your life? Like in the aspect of um, how you interact with other people as well, because the rich man was rich on earth, but he went to hell at the same time. So it speaks a lot about heart posture, the relationship with mm-hmm. God. Mm-hmm. So That's my piece. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, you got the story. I, I will give you that. You definitely, got, you definitely got the story. On the um, on the screen, you're you're seeing the handout that um, Dr. Ruffin passed to us, and the parable is the rich man and Lazarus. Now, I'm first question that I had when I looked at it because I remember the story, but I had not studied it in, in some time. The first thing I looked at was why does why does only one of them have a name? So I, I let go of the Lazarus for a moment, looked at the rich man. So I said, in other words, in Jesus's parables, wherever he leaves no one at all, wherever he, he leaves no identifying factor, that means that any of us can get in to that particular place. He, anybody can assume the role of the rich man. Lazarus, that name, that's a beautiful name. It, it, it actually means God helps me. So I got a rich man and a man who God helps. That's the first thing I saw. So as you go to the handout and we read through it real quick, I, got, I don't have a lot of time. No, let's go to, go to the end of page two, because that's where the actual scripture begins. If you go to the end of page two, you're going to see there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously, there we go, every day. Now, let me tell you something about that purple business. If he was rich enough to wear purple, it takes thousands of whatever it is, whatever sea animal that it is to create purple. So this man had to be able to really afford some serious stuff who was clothed in purple. That's that's a point that Luke is making is that he is extremely rich. You know, he Bill Gates, you know, he's, this is not rich, this is wealth. He's wealthy. So there was a certain man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus full of sores who was laid at his gate. There's where he was. He's laid at that man's gate. Desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. In the Old Testament, Abraham's bosom is considered being in heaven. You're you're being rocked in heaven. Um, You're in the bosom of God in heaven. 
So now verse number 23 says, and being in torments in Hades, um, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus within his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham says, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to tell from the dead, they will repent. Hmm. But he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded through one rise from the dead. This, um, this parable has a lot to do with how we live today. A whole lot to do with how we live today. Let me ask you a question. Uh, how, many, how many of you that are on the line believe in him? Me. Okay. When you think of hell, what do you see? What, what's well, in your mind's eye? What do you see? In, for me, uh, in my mind, I see a lot of fire. Okay. Anybody else? I do. I see separation from God for eternity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody mm -hmm. else? Fire. So fire. Okay. So in other words, let's 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 do this. In life coaching, there's one thing that I always do. I always find the the the, the ground, the foundation. So the foundation of this story is we have two men, two men. They live two different earthly lives, but they are still two men. There are two things in their lives that happen that make them equal, regardless of what happens in between those two things. One is they were born and the other is they will die. What happens between those things is what separates the two from being equal. But the issue is that both men died and now the rich man is poor and the poor man is rich. That's one of the things that Jesus is attempting to show us. So what does that say to you about the rich man and his behavior while he was on there? What does that say to you? Mm. Money was his God. Yes. Yeah, and I think um, rich has more than one meaning because okay. for the man that was living, um, it, rich for him was all the fine things and it was stuff and, and money. But for Lazarus, when he became rich, it was love mm -hmm. and caring. So I, I just think when we think about being rich, you know, we have to figure out where do we place our value? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, when the scripture, when, when Jesus told the story, he mm -hmm. made sure that you understood that he was monetarily rich. He said there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. He's wealthy. Mm -hmm. That's what he means. That's what he's saying. We're talking about some serious wealth here. So that was his as, idol. That was his idol. Yeah, well, very much so. I would have to say very much so. In the parable right before this one, Jesus talks about no, nobody can serve two masters. Mm, yes. When you read, when, let me tell you the greatest thing about Luke. Luke is, what well, I want to say, precise. Luke is accurate. Luke is a doctor. So when he writes something, He's got all the parts that he needs. He's studied. He's scientific. So he studied everything and he knows what should go in there and what shouldn't. So he's 
making sure that you understand the words of Jesus. He could have said, Jesus told a story about a rich man and a beggar. He could have said that, but he didn't. He didn't. Luke said, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Then he says, but there was a certain beggar named Lazarus full of sores who laid at that man's gate. There is the foundation of what's happening. There are two people uh, as different in life as they could possibly be. One being extremely wealthy, one being extremely poor and in poor health. So now we have that and we're looking at that. So when you look at that and, 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 and it says he desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from, his rich, from the rich man's table and the dogs came and licked his sword. The dogs coming and licking his sword, that was sent by God. The dogs looking in were sent by God. So if we take a look at this, what do you see? What does your mind's eye see when you see these two men? How did they interact with one another? What do you think? I don't think they did interact with each other. Um, okay. The certain rich man was way above Lazarus. Just like Justin said in his analogy, one was on top and one was at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And so he saw, he didn't see him. He was invisible to him. God, there you go. There you go. There you go. He could not see out of his comfort zone. Mm, He could not see out of his comfort zone. So let's go to today's world. You ready? Because, you know, I'll throw you with throw one of these things out at you that you see every day. Now, every day we pass by somebody who's got a sign that says we'll work for something, Mm -hmm. something. Do we see them anymore? Have we seen them so much that we don't see them anymore? That Mm -hmm. they don't, they don't um, jerk on our heartstrings to, Mm -hmm. to ask them, what can I get for you? Right. So that's putting that parable into our daily lives now. Or if, or, or now I don't know how much is going on in Columbia because I'm not there as much. I used to come in and out of Columbia when I was going to Hannibal, but my people are gone. So I don't come into Missouri as much, but here in Dallas, you, you pass someone every day on their way into the store who needs something to eat, or you can tell that they are, an addict. I mean, you pass, we pass people every day who mm-hmm. are in terrible condition, who have sores, let me tell you. Mm-hmm. They may not be on their body, but they have sores mm-hmm. that we can look at. My question to us is, have we gotten to the point where we don't see them anymore? Do you stop? Do you say anything? Do you offer a prayer? Mm-hmm. Do you do anything at all? Mm-hmm. Is there a tip? Is there a cool drink of water mm-hmm. on the end of your finger, Father? Mm. 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 <laughs> is there a cool drink of water on the end of your finger for that? Not for everyone I see, but okay, okay. That's just the honest. That's just the honest answer. Not for everyone you see. Right. Anybody else got an answer? I think there okay. are times when God gives um, discernment um, sometimes to people that you are to reach out to. And um, I see people every day. And yes, there are still people here every day that you will run into in Columbia on every corner at any given time, almost, especially in the intersections. And there are mm-hmm. times when I do give something. And then there are other times that I don't. And I just think it's as God leads me to and puts it on my heart at that time, that's when I feel like I have that discernment to, to give. Okay. I, I would say, I, I would say, yeah, I would have to say that's, that's a very agreeable thing. Who said I agree? Go ahead. I agree with six, uh, sister Shavetta Cox. Uh, sometimes I don't always give, but when I don't give, I send a prayer, mm-hmm. you know, because mm-hmm. you can't always stop when you're driving. So mm-hmm. I ask God to bless him, to help him, because he knows their needs. So I do send up a prayer. Okay. All right. So I'm going to let you read the rest of this. But if you would, Pam, if you could pull that, um, 
thing that I sent you on the rich man and Lazarus, because what I want to show you is how to break a parable down and look at it for yourself and see exactly what it's saying to you. So I typed this out for you because I wanted you to see what I, this is what I do when I'm getting ready to teach. So I wanted you to be able, I don't ever want to come and teach something and nobody else can come behind me and teach it. I should be teaching you how to do, how to expound on anything that you're learning. So let's, let's go into this and learn how to break it down and look at what it's saying to us. Okay. We know the scripture. We know what, what this is. And it says that I tell you that we've been studying the parables of Jesus and it's a simple story to illustrate a moral or a spiritual lesson wow. It's told by Jesus to show the comparison of the kingdom of heaven and the teachings of Jewish law, how the two do not go together. On many occasions, always remember this. When you see these words, please remember this. Say this with a, with a straight face. Look up in the air and say, <laughs> Jackie said, whenever you see the words, the kingdom of heaven is like, stand straight up and look and, and open your ears and listen with all you have in you because wisdom is speaking. That's Jesus getting ready to tell us something we don't know on our own. The kingdom of heaven is like, so always remember that. Even in his prayer, the Lord's prayer, what did he say? He said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the first giveaway that that's what's exactly what he's trying to show us. So parables have four parts. You'll see that right there. And they're purposely placed to teach us kingdom living here on earth. Now, the rich man and Lazarus, there's the principle. What do you think the principle of this story is? The principle meaning what, what, what is the one thing that, that Jesus is trying to drive home? What particular idea, if you were writing a, a, a thesis or something, what's your foundational idea? What's the principle of why he's telling this story? Mm. Uh, yes, it's difficult. Uh, it's, that's well, difficult. Definitely, our riches are not to be had here on this earth. Right. One of the things that that um, spoke to me, well, I wrote some things down as I was going through it. So let me tell you what I wrote down. Okay. Uh, use your possessions with eternity in mind. Hmm. That was one of the principles I saw. Jesus saying that the rich man walked on past and didn't see anything, then never considered anything past the way he was living at the present time. So I would say he needed to learn to use his possessions with eternity in mind. And as stewards of our possessions, we're not the owners. We're not the owners of what we have. So that's the principle. To me, that was some of the principles that I got from anybody else get a principle. Don't be scared to say something because nobody's answer is wrong. Yes. Um, for me, and it's kind of similar to what we've been talking about. Don't be selfish with um, what God has blessed us with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is really, really very true. Now, if we were to look, if we were to say, is there a proverb? that perhaps speaks to this. I found Proverbs 10, 22. I, okay, so we're going to Proverbs and we are going to, a wise son brings joy to his father. And in verse 22, it says, the blessing of the Lord brings wealth without pain, without painful toil for it. In other words, the money is not the money. The money is a blessing. Mm -hmm. And you didn't have to toil for it. Mm -hmm. So you shouldn't have a problem giving some of it away. Mm -hmm. See, if I, can just, if I can just watch God's hand, if I'm watching God's hand move, there's three things that, that Christian people, disciples should always be doing. We should always be waiting to feel God's presence. We should always be waiting to see his hand move. And we should always be waiting to hear his voice. So, the blessing of the Lord brings wealth. All right, that's it. His hand is moving on my behalf. Mm -hmm. And I, I that, which means I don't have to toil for what's going on. But in gratitude, I need to remember the least of these. Jesus said, because there's also, when he says, when he, who, when did you see me? Um, when did I see you 
and you and I didn't take care of you. He said, well, you did it to the least of these. There was somebody that was hungry. There was somebody that you heard about a, a lady in the church who had lost her job and has children and she has five children. Her husband is dead. Did anybody get together and say, I wonder how we can help her? Even though it doesn't appear that she needs something, you still need to go ask, how can we help you? So the, the, that's the proverb. That's one of them. There were several that came up, but there were that was the one that I chose. Now, if we go to the point, what is the point that Jesus is making here? Wait, hold on. Can you say the, uh, the verse again? Proverbs. What? Proverb, Proverb 10, verse 22 is oh, the one I chose. You. If you go, if you take your search engine or something like Bing and say, give me Proverbs, uh, what was it? Proverbs on, on wealth. Just write Proverbs on wealth and it'll, it'll list them. It'll come back and list you a whole bunch of them. And I chose that one because I like that one the most. Now, if we get to the point, this is where the rubber's getting ready to meet the road. The point that Jesus is making is what? I do for you and you should be able to do for others. I agree. I like that. Anybody else? And also that your wealth does not get you to heaven. Amen. It's like the mm. rich man, he still thought he was above Lazarus. In yeah. heaven, while that he was, was in was, heaven. Yeah, right. I mean, while he was in hell. Yes. Right, yeah. uh-huh. Like Lazarus was his servant. Can, can mm -hmm. Lazarus bring me some water? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Had the nerve enough to look up from hell and say, <laughs> can y'all stop what y'all doing up there in that nice place where you are? In, in that glorious place where you are, where y'all all are worshiping and having a great time. Could somebody just hand a brother a glass of wine? I mean, just dip your finger. Just dip your finger. Give me a yeah, little. Yeah, that's what he said. He said <laughs> he didn't want no finger full. If he told the truth, he would just try and be nice. If he told the truth, he want a whole glass of wine. I guarantee you. Ah. Anyway, uh, the, the, the point is simply this, and I made it earlier. There's a day you're born and there's a day you die. That makes us all equal. It's what we do in the middle. Mm -hmm. That's Amen. what Jesus is showing. It's what you do in the middle. You can't serve two masters. It's what you do in the middle that's going to determine your eternity. So when we get to the purpose of this, the purpose of it, Jesus spoke more about hell than anyone else in scripture. I forgot to write down how many times I found it, but he spoke more about hell than anyone else in scripture. He also let us know that hell was not a place that um, that was uh, a party place. Mm -hmm. You know, it, 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 hell was a place that was tor of torment. So when I say the word torment, what do you think of? Torture. If you were tormented, what would be going on? I'm going to tell you, when everybody else thought, I'm going to tell you what I thought of. First thing I thought of. Pain. If I'm tormented, I'm in pain. I'm in misery. I'm okay. in discomfort. Um, mm -hmm. It's um, almost unbearable to live from day to day if I'm in torment. Anything gets on my nerves. It seems like everything is out to take your life away from you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Um, yeah, and I would just say, um, kind of go back to what I said earlier, just... Um, separation from God, just um that um emptiness that um as somebody else said torture. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me tell you what I thought of. <laughs> I will do anything to mm. keep from going to to keep from going to the dentist. I do not like the dentist. Mm -hmm. And when I thought of hell, I said hell for me would be going to the dentist's office with nothing to deaden my mouth and he's just drilling away. Yeah. Mm. Mm. That <laughs> <laughs> you hurried up and shook your head on that. I mean, I said, if I had to live that every single day, that would be hell for me. So when I had to put it in a, in a space and put it in words and make it something so that I could, I could knee jerk myself and say, hold up this minute, hell is not a place I want to go. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. This is not a place I want to go. Because if I had to deal with that on a daily basis, no, this is not a place I want mm -hmm. to go. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of that was to, to give you a visual of the torment of hell. 
So when we identify the people in the story, who is the rich man? Who is Lazarus? Let me ask a question. Wait, who do you think this rich man is? Tell me what, what you see when you see him. What, what does he look like? Trump. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, anybody, I'm, a, I'm not even going to tell me on that. <laughs> I was going to say a politician, uh, but that's right up there. With, that's true, with that's us. true, that's true, that's true. I'm, because I said. <laughs> that is true, because they are no longer acting as servants. Mm -hmm. They're acting mm -hmm. as gods now. So they don't, it used to be a politician was your servant. Mm -hmm. They were there for the betterment of the people, but now they tell us what we should do. So, if, so who, so the rich man to you looks like someone, okay, so you're saying the rich man is someone who is in control, perhaps. Well, the um, rich man, I think he's in, in control. Well, yeah, he does. Yes, he does. Believe me, he does. Um, so who is Lazarus to you? Tell me, tell me what Lazarus looks like to you. What, who is your Lazarus that you can, you can see in your mind's eye? Do, is there a Lazarus somewhere around? Oh, Louis. Homeless. homeless. The homeless? Yes. How big is your homeless community in Colombia? Over Huge. 200, right, Sister Shaw? The population? More than yes. Is, is it a lot? Do you see them? Do it's you see them everywhere or do they have a certain place where they gather? Oh, they're everywhere. They're everywhere? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. At the public so, library. At the public library, really? Yeah. They're in there and during the day to get warm? Or is that mm -hmm. what it is? Mm hmm. OK. All right. So we discuss what the two men have in common, the fact that they have a birth date and they have a day when they leave here. But my biggest question is and I and I, I really I ask a question here. Um, and I and I use the word that I'm not I don't know how. I don't know if you understand the word. I don't know if you use the word. I don't know if you're in study for it. But I say, how do we use this parable in discipleship? How do we use this parable to go out and tell someone about Jesus? How do we use this parable to transform lives? That's what I want to know. Is there, can, you, can you see a way to use this parable to transform a life? I'm gonna let you think about that because you can, you can, everybody should get a copy of this and you can just go through it. This can be your daily devotion to sit and think about a few things. So I want you also to take the time to tell this story in your own words, making yourself the rich man. Put yourself in the rich man's place. Because really, honestly, as a living being, I ain't trying to be in Lazarus' spot. Mm -mm. No. Mm -mm. So I'm going to tell the story. Since there is no name for the rich man, I'm going to put my name in there. Mm. And I'm gonna write my story about what I do or what I see when I see mm -hmm. Lazarus. What do I see and what do I do? So, and also at the very bottom of the first page, it says, in looking at your life as a follower of Christ, is God impressed with the way you treat all of his children? Ooh. Ooh. Mm hmm. Is God impressed? No. <laughs> mm hmm. So I'm going to ask you a real, these, these questions are going to get harder because when you go through parables, parables are to pull out any thorns you got in your flesh, anything that's not looking good. So here we go. It, <laughs> is God impressed with your faith, with your compassion, with your beliefs? And here I'm going to hit you with a big one, your religion. <laughs> because you see, that rich man went to church. I guarantee you he went to, to synagogue. I guarantee you he paid money to the church. I guarantee you he went through all the motions. All the motions. That's why he thought he was going to heaven. All the motions. Yeah, I was always told that just because you go to church no, don't mean that it's going to get you into heaven. Well, what keeps you from heaven? Well, we, when you do things that you already know is against God, that God would not be pleased with, like if you, if you still lie, she that's sort of so thing. in other words in other words you believe your actions can send you to hell that's what you're saying yes okay. if if you if you don't truly confess and repent yes ma'am in other words if it becomes a lifestyle right 
Okay. All right. I, I agree. I agree with that. But actually, now, a lot of people think God sends them to hell, but he doesn't. You send yourself to hell. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and mm-hmm. that's really very hard. When you, when you encounter someone who doesn't know God well or who has left the church because of pain or whatever, or they felt judged or whatever, and they encounter someone like me, and they say, well, you know, uh, I, I don't understand that God is supposed to love everybody that sends people to hell. I said, God, don't send you to hell. And they look at me and go, do what? I said, God will not. God does not. God, it is not. Paul wrote, it is not his will that any should perish. That means to be rendered useless, to be, be no more than a rag full of water that he just wrings out. No, that's not his will. That is not his will. If you go to hell, you did that on your own. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And people stop and look at me and say, are you kidding me? I said, no. And if you really study the Bible instead of listening to some people that are really are not uh, versed in how in who God is and how he does things, then you will begin to understand that God does not send you to hell. This is something you will do all on your own. So when we talk about your religion, is God impressed with your religion? Do, when I say religion, do you know what I'm, what comes to your mind when I say your religion? What, um, the way you serve, where, where you serve it. Okay. Okay. I would Anybody say, else? Yes. Go ahead. Um, for me, like, are we acting like the Pharisees in Jesus' time? Mm-hmm, because they were really religious, weren't they? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Y'all gonna get sick of me because I'm gonna make you think now. You ready? <laughs> <laughs> you ready? Is your church or community of faith a place yeah. of inclusion? In other words. On Sunday morning, when everybody's all gathered there and somebody comes in that don't look good, smell good, act good, may may seem to have perhaps some mental or emotional, you know, something's going on with, are you good with it? Are you all turning around looking like they don't belong there? Is Who's there to welcome those people? Whose arms are wide open when they walk in? Who's there to do that? Robin. Okay. So, so you are a church of inclusion. Our ushers, our Your ushers. ushers. Yes, yeah. they say should the be. Yes, yeah. yeah, they should be. Yes. We, we do have some gifted. It, our ushers are gifted to do what they do. Mm-hmm. That's good. That's good. That's but good. It's that not you just have on that. them. We we, we got to do the same. Yeah, <laughs> that is true. Mm-hmm. Now I'm going to ask you a real hard question because this was asked. Um, this was asked in the book that I had. It says, "Is your church?" Located in a gated community. You know what it means to have a gated community? Mm-hmm. So I saw that. Yeah. And, and here mm-hmm. in Atlanta, a, a lot of churches are in gated communities. And I guess mm-hmm. I can see why. But I, mm-hmm. I didn't see much of that in Columbia. No. But let, let's take it from a spiritual standpoint. Mm-hmm. Is your church in a gated community? Oh, yeah. yeah right. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Whoever closed? said yes is right. Whoever mm-hmm. said yes is right. Mm-hmm. There's Whoever. not a church that isn't integrated. There's not a church that don't have its own clique of people. There's not a church that doesn't have its own group of people that run it. There's not a bunch of that. It's just not there for everybody. Come on, people. Let's tell the truth. It's not there for everybody. It's gated. It is gated. Oftentimes our churches are gated. And people come in and they see that and they leave. Leave. Yes, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because we are gated. Well, you just found where we get a chance. But, but I, I, I want to say oh, something too. Oh, just try uh, whatever we get off. Okay. Can, no hold worry. on, somebody, somebody, can you, you know. mute your? We, we're listening to somebody's conversation. Can you mute your your mic for us? Thank you. Go ahead, whoever was talking. Go ahead. Okay, it's this is Sister Three. Um, oh, hi, sweetie. How you doing? I'm so I glad to see you. It's good um, to see you. I I think uh, that it's not necessarily gated in terms of even the clicks mm-hmm. or um, um, I think some of the gating comes out of history and tradition mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because, you know, you can arrive here and you can come into the church, but you, I remember my first uh, meeting with some of the ladies, they took me to lunch and at the end of the lunch, they were so cute. You know, I wasn't offended, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but they, you know, they were the elder women of the church. And, and they told me, 
you clearly were not raised Baptist. I mean, they just said that that straight out to me. And so what they were telling me was, we we know you love the Lord, but you're not walking in the tradition, Mm -hmm. the history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that dropped a gate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That dropped a gate. And so and gave you, know, you and gave you no access code to get in. Well, you know, you could come to the WMU and you know you could do all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, but still is their mind. You right. were Baptist. But but the but the his but you know, even with that, i I wouldn't have the 20 years of being a Baptist that they had at that time. Mm-hmm. You know, I would never catch up to them in knowing all the Baptist things, the red circle girls and all those things. You know, and so that I think we do that. I think also there are people who have gated Second Baptist from the outside. They won't oh, absolutely, come in. absolutely. They won't absolutely. come in because mm-hmm. they Grandma Jane. You know, twenty five years ago, something happened, and they've been mm-hmm. raised up knowing that all their life, so they won't come in. Right, the gating goes both ways. Mm-hmm. The gating definitely <laughs> goes both ways. So when we're talking about a gated community, um, the only thing that I could say to you is that you all were very, very um, receptive of me. And I did appreciate that. I came there to study and I studied under Dr. Ruffin and I learned a great deal. Um, he definitely taught me how to stand on a podium and preach. That, that was what I came there for. Many other things I had studied and learned before that, but he was so good at what he did. I said, he's gotta be something that he can teach me. So I left the denomination I was in. Now, let me tell you, that's where I got gated. When I left the denomination I was in to come to Second Baptist and work with Dr. Ruffin, I got gated out of the disciple of Christ as far as some of them were concerned. Even my mother sat back and, and value, you know, my mom, you know, I'm out. She t- turned and looked at me and said, are you sure about what you're doing? I said, I'm very sure about what I'm doing. She said, well, then I'm going to leave it alone. Did, you, did God tell you to do that? I said, yes, he did, Mom. Yes, he did. So you can be gated. We have these gates built inside of our religion. And that's the reason I ask you that question. Are you gated? Is there any portion of you even that's gated? If, and, and this is my last question to you. Is God applauding you when he watches your daily walk with those that are less fortunate than you? Have you ever considered that God may be applauding you? He may be watching what you're doing and he's applauding what he sees. He's telling all the angels, come here, look, 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 watch, watch, watch. I just love it all. Give her a hand, y'all. Is God applauding you? Are you doing what, what the rich man did or is God applauding you? I love y'all. We would we would try to assimilate ourselves to do something that God would applaud us for. Yes. Yes. But again, going back to the Good Samaritan, we do it because we see the need not to be applauded. We're doing it because we, we see a need and God is applauding because we never took ourselves into consideration. We took care of the need. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So that is the reason why I'm asking you. You have to understand the way they have these um, parables written that one is leading into the other. So you got to pay attention to the point, the principle, the proverb, everything that you're getting, the purpose that's coming through each proverb, because you're going to see how they tie together. Now, for those of you who wanted questions from the book that I am reading, here they are. In my book, this story is chapter nine. And it asks the question, why is it important to teach the horrors of hell? How do you re- personally respond to teaching? Let me ask you that. If you hear a sermon and it's about going to hell, does it make you uncomfortable? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I want, I want how many, how many, oh, yeah, do I have? A bunch of us. Yeah. Does anybody, is anybody, oh, yeah. is anybody yeah. not uncomfortable when they hear a sermon about hell? I'm not uncomfortable. Okay. I'm not All right. Un- Anybody else? I'm not. Those of you that are not uncomfortable, tell us why. I ain't going, so I'm not uncomfortable. Uh, That that should be the answer. 
<laughs> that should be the answer. That's mean. Because okay. everybody should know. You should know your stand right now, where mm -hmm. you stand. Mm -hmm. You know, you should know where you stand in the scheme of things. Mm -hmm. So you should know whether you're going to hell or whether you're not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is very good. Uh, we does it does that particular sermon offend you or frighten you? Which one does it do? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you, when I was younger, they come up with them hell sermons, man, I would try to find a way to go to the bathroom, anything. I don't want to hear it. Amen. It, 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 it reminds me, it pricks my, my thankfulness to everything that, that Jesus gave and God gave for me. It makes me grateful. So it makes me look more to heaven, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, okay. and I always listen to the sermons on hell, like, uh, you know how you put uh, antiseptic or something on a wound? You cut mm -hmm. yourself mm -hmm. and, you, and, and then you follow it with cocoa butter because you not only want it to heal, but you don't want it to discolor. Mm -hmm. and so that's the way I listen to hell. This is just a reminder of what I need to do to, to stay healthy, to stay in the right place, to heal properly without us, you know, discoloration. Okay, so what you're saying, hell is doing nothing about the sore or the, 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 the accident whatsoever, just letting it fester and get worse and worse and worse. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying it, 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 it tells me, if, if, using the example of, of a sore or an injury, mm -hmm. it tells me how to avoid these injuries okay so that all I right. don't okay. need i won't need the antiseptic okay that's the way i look at it okay so right now i want you to just sit quietly i want you to concentrate on hell and tell me what effect is it having on you what change may i be making in when you're thinking about hell. First of all, I'm thinking about being lonely because my people mm -hmm. are in heaven. Mm -hmm. My people taught me how to get to heaven. Mm -hmm. They, my mother told me that God prepared a place for me and I have mm -hmm. to prepare myself to go to the prepared place. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm, when I think about hell, I get a feeling of utter loneliness because nobody I love will be there. Mm -hmm. And that's scary. Mm -hmm. That means I didn't follow the direction. That means that all that was trying to be taught to me, I wasn't paying attention to. Because it wasn't that I wasn't in the presence of people who were teaching me because I was. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't paying attention. So that's, that's scary to me. Now, I'm not so much the torment of, of, of really actually the torment of the drill and the dentist fades when I think about being there alone. Because I'm, we were always made to believe that when we die, there's going to be a great family reunion. Mm -hmm. I'm, there's a family reunion I'm going to have in heaven. So going to hell makes, puts me in a lonely place, someplace I, I don't want to be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So let me ask you, what is your main takeaway from this lesson? What did you take? What did you take away from this parable of the rich man and Lazarus? What did you take away? Well, um, what I got from it is was that you're not supposed to be so wrapped up on money to the point where you can't try to help somebody who don't have. Okay, don't stop at money because we can be wrapped up in a lot of things right now. You were, well, you know, that's a... You, you gotta I understand to what you're people. saying, though. Yes, I understand what you're saying. In other words, do not make an idol out of anything. Right. Is what, yeah. Let's not have any idols. Anybody else have anything they've taken away from this lesson? Um. Yes, for me, it just kind of goes hand in hand of what I read this morning in my quiet time. I read Matthew 19, 24. And it says, mm -hmm. um, again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of God. And um, just kind of what you just said, um, it's not just about money per se, it's about making an idol of anything. Mm -hmm. So when you think about I have an idol, let me make sure that you all have the correct perspective on what that really means. When we say the eye of an idol, what are you thinking of? You see a camel and what's a camel doing? 
Trying to get through what? The eye of a needle. A very, no. very small place. A very small place. Fit. Yes. And let me tell you where that is. In Jerusalem, one of the gates is called the eye of the needle. And it's very low. And so a camel has to get on its uh, down on all fours and it has to scoot its way through. And usually the camel is bigger than the opening. So there's a bit of pain involved with that camel getting through there. Mm -hmm. So th the eye of the needle is a small place uh, where you're trying to get through and it is painful. There's a lot going on. And, and for some, they don't get through there. They back away. They don't they don't go through. So thank you for that scripture. That was really, really, um, really, really does match this. Um, we have a hand, um, Sister Phyllis. Oh, OK, because see, I can't. I'm not with my big screen, so I don't see it. Go ahead. Whoever has the hand. It's Phyllis. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just surprised that nobody has referred to the scripture or maybe we have it in our minds, but nobody said it verbally. Um, Galatians six and the latter portion of eight which mm -hmm. reminds us that we reap what we sow. And I think if we go with um, the reminder that we, our reward in heaven is dependent on what we've placed on earth, it kind of puts things into perspective for me. You asked mm -hmm. earlier, earlier you stated that we don't have very many sermons on hell, which is very true. I think that um, too often some of our ministers, some of our pastors, some of our leaders are afraid to offend people, but I would much rather be offended right here, right now, than when God calls me home. Mm -hmm. So I, I like to remember that what I'm doing right now prepares me for my final days and my final resting place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to ask you one last question, and that's going to showed you that you are you're reaping correctly okay how many disciples do i have on the line you mean uh, that's a, the, uh, the disciples the disciples right? disciples disciples what did jesus say he said go you therefore and make the disciples so we're all we are all the church the building we go to is god's house yeah and we the working people that are in society we who are bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth are the disciples so how many disciples do I have on the line? 22. Oh, thank you. All right, yes. then. Yes. Oh, yes. That's what I'm talking about. That's mm -hmm. what I'm talking about. You'd be surprised how many times I ask that and people go, I really don't know. And I go, we need to talk. <laughs> well, I was working towards it, Rev. Mm -hmm. I think that the one thing that we don't use that word enough, and that's why I said something about your religion, we need to use generic terms that cross the board. I, I am I disciple? Yes. Do I go to church? I go to worship at Second Baptist. Right. I, I am a member of the body, the church. I'm a member of the church, right. the body of Christ at Second right. Baptist. That's where I worship. Right. And, and that's what yeah. I say to people when they ask me here, well, where do you go to church? I said, well, I am a disciple and I am a member of the body at Impact. I worship at Impact Church. And they go, oh. What? I, I said, ah, I got you, didn't I? I don't go to church. I am the church. When I go to church, I'm going to worship. Mm -hmm. When I go to God's house, I'm going there to worship. I'm going there to sing praises. I'm going there to wave my hands. I'm going there to shout hallelujah. I'm going there to let God know. I know what you have done for me. I know what you're continuing to do for me. And I just want to be the loudest one here letting you know that this morning. Amen. So when people say, why do I need to go to church? You don't need to go to church. You need to become the church and go to God's house and worship. Yes. The church is in you. Yes. 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 Well, I because worship when, online at second. You worship online? That's fine. At, at fine. second. At mm -hmm. second? Okay. In, in my church. In the larger churches here, you got a lot of people online. And sometimes you have to say to them, I want you to be my guest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And come. And I'll be standing at the door waiting for you. And then they say, well, nobody's ever done that before. I didn't know. And, and always watch those people who come to church, sit in the back. They come right after it starts and they leave right before it's over. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. The disciples ought to be at the back door. Somebody it's so nice to have you. And what is your name again? We look forward to seeing you. You got to let those people know that you saw them. 
Yes. There's nothing more important to people than to know that they were seen. Mm -hmm. They were seen. We saw you. We mm -hmm. see you. And we appreciate you being here. And we mm -hmm. want to hear from you. We want to know what you think. Mm -hmm. We are the church at impact. So you all are the church at Second Baptist. You worship at Fourth and Broadway. The angel of the house is Reverend Dr. Clyde Ruff. I mean, there's a whole, when people say, I don't go to church, well, I don't, I'm, not asking you, I'm asking you to come with me. I am the church and mm -hmm. worship with me at Second Baptist this morning. Do you want to go? Mm -hmm. And that throws people because they, they, they what do you mean? I, 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 mm -mm. All your thoughts about what the church is, that's what's stopping you from going. Let me tell mm -hmm. you what it really is, because if you really knew what it was, you wouldn't care who's in there. Right. You'd be going there to work to worship. That's what you'd be going right. for. Mm -hmm. right. You'd be going there to sing. Right. You'd be going there to clap your hands. You'd be going there mm -hmm. to hear the word that God mm -hmm. sent to the man of the house, mm -hmm. his people. You would be going there for that. Yeah. So we, we want to always keep in mind with this parable, especially that this parable is teaching us that it's not so much about about living right to get to here to get to there it's it's about being eternity minded in all that you do even with your money be eternity minded you should always have eternity your your resting place on your mind when you're doing things last week when we were talking about the samaritan man the question was asked at the end of it um what would happen to that man if the samaritan hadn't stopped the question that i would have deeper into me as a disciple is what would happen to me if I had not stopped? What would God be saying to me? He, he would have he would have gut checked me before I could get 50 feet yeah. away and say, I know you saw that man sitting there. I know mm -hmm. you did. Mm -hmm. I know you did. Mm -hmm. I know you. I know I I know. <clears throat> I know for all the times that I have rescued you, that you are mm -hmm. not gonna pass by this man as Ooh. though you do not see him. Stop it. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. I mean. I mean, I, I, as all of you know, I had a son that died. God was there the minute I found out about it. He healed my heart before I could grieve. He rescued me. He, there is nothing worse than you losing someone that's been in your life the whole time. I mean, I watched my mother grieve my father. I watched, I watched people grieve. And every time I do, I say to the Lord, I thank you so much. Mm -hmm. because this, I thank you because that was a pain you did not let me go into. You let me know what you had done. So there are things that in gratitude, I just can't walk past something and not say something. I can't walk past a person that's in need. I can't look at a mother in my church and see her struggling with three little kids and see that they're not really being taken care of as well as they can. And I come up behind her and say, good, good morning. I'm Jackie. Mm -hmm. And she said, I know I've heard about you. I said, yeah, that's what me and you need to talk. You want to talk? And she said, yeah. Pull it to the side. It's not a conversation for everybody. Nobody needs to know what's going on. I just mm -hmm. need to make sure the ministers know what we need to do to help her. Mm -hmm. And so there we have it. That's the church in motion, the church mm -hmm. in action. Mm -hmm. And that's what this is about. This is about being in action, doing mm -hmm. what you need to do. So I thank y'all so much for being with me tonight. And I'm so sorry that I was a few minutes late. Anyway, um, <laughs> I got mine up early. <laughs> well, good. I am glad. Does anybody have anything they want to? Somebody tell me what's on your heart right now. What do we let? Give us something to take away as we go. Somebody, somebody. Well, um, I, 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 I got got from a member that he's got a a sick brother, a brother that's on the verge of death, on, on the verge of dying. Who is it again? Tell me. I'm James, sorry. James Patterson. He used, he used oh. to go to second. Yeah, I know. I know Mr. Patterson. Mr. Patterson is sick or his brother is sick? I think he said his brother is sick. Oh, okay. All right. His brother okay. passed away. Yeah. Oh, he did? Okay. Yeah. All right. It's my so, understanding that uh, Pastor Freeman, Mr. Freeman's mother passed away as well. Mm -hmm. Some of my yes. friends told me. Yeah, some of my friends were telling me. About, I have to come there. Uh, on the 15th and that uh, I'll be at um, pastor's banquet that you're having for him. Cause I have to be there on the 15th oh, to do God. a women's conference. So um, it, it's good to see all of you. It's good to be with all of you, but a kingdom, give me a kingdom principle. Give me something that you're taking with you from that you learned from the kingdom tonight. Give me something you're taking with you. What's you taking with you? Are you taking hell with you? Are you taking with you that you need to be eternity minded? What are you taking with you when you leave tonight? Well, I'm taking. Oh, go ahead, Jennifer. Well, I'm taking with me that we got 
we got to practice what we preach and, and try to help one, one another. Do you preach with your mouth or with your actions? Which one do you preach with? With, with, your, with your actions. No, okay. Thank you so much. I'm glad you do. A lot of people have a lot of lip work and no action. Oh, wait, who else? Who mm -hmm. else is, is was talking? Me, Christina. I was going to mm -hmm. say um, about um, like seeing people in need. Sometimes we may not have the money or we might not feel comfortable giving money. But one thing that my sister and I have done in the past is uh, make little bags <laughs> with like little snacks. Um, and um, one day I even reached out to the church and Pastor Ruffin supplied me like with with like, like little Bible tracks and um, mm -hmm. just some like blankets to hand mm -hmm. out. And mm -hmm. um, I put in like like some water bottles and we just handed them out to people. Mm hmm. So well, I know one of the things that the second is is one of their auxiliaries that's really great and thrived when I was there um, was the women's mission. And I often wondered, I, I used to think to myself, I wondered if I should tell them, why don't we fix a bunch of soup and find the homeless and take it over there? And then I this was something that I never did. But I would challenge you. I would challenge you to come out of your comfort zone yes. and mm -hmm. do something like that. Do something mm -hmm. like that. Just show up. And when they say, who are you? Say, we are the body at Second Baptist Church. We are the church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We worship at we worship at Fourth and Broadway. You're welcome anytime. Our building is open and, and that's God's house. And we don't say who comes and who doesn't. So we are the church at Second Baptist. We're so happy that we're here with you this evening. It does our heart good to see you eating and doing well. And that's all you need to do. God will take it from there. But is there anybody else? <laughs> Who's taking anything with them tonight as they go? Is there anything about heaven, sister, anything about hell? Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, Sister Jackie, I thank you for this uh, word because I do something at second and I was starting to let the enemy tell me to stop doing it. But I think I'll keep doing it. And that is I try when I don't have to be in the back. I try to come out to the front before service starts. And I try to go up and down the aisle and speak to people and hug mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. you know, um, because I think sometimes when they sit through our whole service, waiting till the end is kind of late mm -hmm. to help people know that we are grateful they're there, that we're glad to see them. Mm -hmm. And I just wish more of us would do that at the beginning of the service, come early and actually greet people and chat with them and visit with them. And that would be like the recognizing the people that we don't mm -hmm. see mm -hmm. sometimes you know as women it's hard for us we can't go up and down the street you know necessarily right. doing that kind of work right. you need but to do it with, in a group of people right right mm -hmm. but it would be safe to do it right in our own sanctuary absolutely I, I, I hear your message that i think that's something we all could do you have a big parking lot and one of the things you could do after church is just simply bring some food with you. And in the parking lot, you could, people would, believe me, people would drive past. It wouldn't take folks long to know. If you took one Sunday a month and did that, it would not take folks long to know that I can get a bowl of soup at Second Baptist parking lot. You know, Reverend Jackie, I have to say that Second is really good about that. They really, there's members of Second that really show love. And mm -hmm. there's so many and I'm going to say of us that gets there early and, and we do share love. With, and it's not always hugging because still during COVID, some yeah. doesn't want to be hugged. Mm -hmm. But I have to say that the members of Second, there's so many of us that, that share love in so many ways. We don't always go and talk about it because, yes. you know, you don't have to talk about the things that you do. Mm -hmm. God knows and you know. Yeah. You know, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Love, yeah. And that's what love is. You know, we talk about love and that's one thing that I, you know, so much that I got from this lesson, you know, mm -hmm. love others as he loved us and love mm -hmm. is action. It's, it's mm -hmm. about doing It's action. Yeah. We are yeah. servants of God. So I, I just enjoy you so much. <laughs> Thank you yeah. for teaching us and breaking this parable down to us. Well, that's okay. That's okay. Somebody had to, well, believe me, it was the Lord himself who broke it down to me. I, I, when I started studying parables, one of the things with going to college and going to seminary or whatever, sometimes your teachers do not really believe in God. They're just teaching 
because they they're teaching you the the Hebrew portion of you know what it meant in in Greek and what it meant you know and and you're really not getting the spiritual aspect of what was going on. I really had to sit down and say to the Lord, I'm paying an awful lot of money to not learn anything about you. So would you could, we, could you come and give a sister a, a hand because not every teacher I have knows you, mm-hmm. and that was very very difficult. That that was I tell anyone who says they want to go to seminary and they want to study. The word, make sure you have teachers that know God. Make sure. And one of the biggest seminaries in the world is right here in Dallas. Dallas Theological Seminary. People come from all over the world here to study. And there are some great teachers there. Tony, Dr. Tony Evans, Dr. Charles Swindoll, Dr. Stanley, Dr. Andy, um, Andy Stanley. Or some, many people have been there. And there's many great teachers. But there are some who are just there teaching. And they really don't know God. So... I'm, it's my, it is my honor, believe me, it is my honor to be able to take what God has given me and giving it to someone else. I am a piece of bread that you just take a piece out of me. And each one of you, as Jesus said, I am the bread. I am your bread this evening. You get a piece of me. You can take your wine with it and we can call it communion. And so, Father God, we thank you. We thank you. I thank you, Lord, that you blessed me and you broke me tonight and you gave them a piece of everything that you have taught me. And for that, I thank you. I ask you, great Rabbi, to come and speak. And you did. You showed up. Your hand was here. I heard your voice and your presence was with us. We learned a lot tonight, Master. And we thank you. We learned that hell is a real thing. Hell is a tormenting thing. Mm -hmm. And hell is a lonely place that I do not intend to go. I have passion my life and I have given you my heart and my purpose and my passion is to live as a disciple. You said, go ye therefore, can you be with me always? And you have been. I have never been alone in all my life. There's never been a time when you have not been with me. And for that, I give you praise. I ask you to take care of these who are on the line with us tonight. Lord, God, God, protect and provide as they leave now, close down their computers and their phones. Cause them to think during the night. Perhaps maybe, Lord, you want to send a dream. But in whatever way you do, make your presence known and make your message known. Make your message known, Lord. And let them say, I heard from God. Let them get out a pencil and a piece of paper, write in a journal that they what they heard from God. Oh, Father, we thank you for the rich man and Lazarus. We thank you, Lord, for the Good Samaritan. We thank you, Lord, for the wheat and the tares. We thank you, Lord, for the unforgiving servant. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Master Jesus. You're the great teacher. The one thing I asked when I became a minister was, Lord, help me to teach like you. And so I thank you, Master. I thank you in all ways. I thank you in all ways and every day. I thank you. I thank you. To go with us, Lord. Take care of our pastor as he lays his mother through many, many years. He has had his mother by his side. She had been his biggest cheerleader, and I know she has, because that was the the relationship I had with my father. He was my biggest cheerleader. And when your biggest cheerleader goes, you're left on your own to cheer, to encourage yourself like David. Yes, yes. Sometimes you have to encourage yourself because your cheerleader is gone. So, Master... Help me to always stay in touch with him so I can encourage him along the way and let him know his cheerleader isn't gone. He just doesn't see her body anymore. But everything she taught him is still intact. Fall back and listen. Listen, think of the snapshots of the beauty of your mother talking to you. Go back in your memory and pull out those snapshots and live a life, the life that she taught you to live. Father, we thank you. Comfort him, oh God. Comfort him, Holy Spirit. Download into him the comfort the comfort that I saw on the mount. As soon as I walked, there was a big stone that said, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Thank you, Master. Thank you, Master. We ask this all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 And amen. And amen. amen. Bye, y'all. I don't know what we're doing next week. Um, I know the funeral isn't until a week from Saturday, I think. So I, I'll be with you until he tells me that I can shut up and go home. Uh, other than that, <laughs> other than that, we'll stay together. I would ask that you go back and look at these four parables and see if you can find any similarities. That's going to be my my assignment to you. Go back and look at the parables. See if you see the similarities. See if you can find the foundation piece that Jesus is teaching. Good night to all of you. Have a great evening. Thank you so much for being with us. This class is getting bigger every week, and I appreciate you. And I thank you so much for your faith in me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. 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 Bye